Welcome to EPTV and another brand new episode for you here live on YouTube. We are taking you behind the scenes in an exclusive new program at some of the biggest equestrian people in the world. We're getting unparalleled access. We had a William Fox Pit Yard tour a little bit earlier on this week with Alice. We've spoken to the newly crowned champion jockey Brian Hughes with Mike Catamol alongside Dickie Johnson a little bit earlier on in the week as well. And both of those episodes are available to view online. So make sure while you're here, you subscribe to EPTV. Click the little bell for notifications as to when we go live as well. But who have we got with you today? Well, we have a world silver medalist and we have an Event Rider Masters leg winner. So without further ado, I will introduce you to our two guests, Harry Mead and Lucy Jackson. Thank you very much both for coming on the show. Delighted to have you with us. Thanks for, for, for having us. And uh, Sorry, Lucy, I jumped in there. You go. But um, Nicole, thanks for having us and looking forward to it. Oh, we're really looking forward to catching up with you both because actually life is a little different at the moment. We're all feeling it wherever in the world we are. Um, Lucy, I'll start with you. How is life in lockdown at Team Jackson at the moment? Life in lockdown, I'm slightly embarrassed to admit, is, is, I'm quite enjoying it just for a short period. I, I, I'm not saying that I'm not going to start going stir crazy within a week or so, but um, we've had a fairly busy season followed by a move to a new yard at Norton. Um, BQES, our new business, we're setting that up. So that has then closely been followed by the start of this season. I know it didn't last very long. Um, so the opportunity to take a deep breath, pack up my house, to move house in the next week. Um, the pause in eventing for me right now, just at this moment, is uh, a, a convenient hiatus. Although, as I say, I'll be stir crazy within a, a week, no doubt. We've got to look for the positives. So for now, absolutely take that. Harry, how are things at Team Mead with you? Well, it's very similar to Luce. We um we actually bought our yard in um in November. So we sort of came straight off the back of the season, uh, got briefly settled in and actually it's quite nice to be able to sort of get sorted properly. But also uh timing wise, you know, seeing the children running around here, also for us to be able to be on site, have all our staff living on site, um, it's it's a massive benefit, you know, particularly with you know travel being more difficult and you know we've got our own bubble here and you know although we're not um totally protected from from things because there's obviously outside pressures and you know sort of finances and things and yeah you know, everyone's struggling at the moment um and there's knock-on effects of that in every industry but um but from the point of view of working the horses and training the horses it's it's great to be able to be on site living on site and you know from their point of view they know no difference except there's no events but from the training point of view at least they can make progress and, and carry on much as normal yeah absolutely and i think that's a really valid point logistically actually that must make life a huge amount easier uh can i ask how's homeschooling the kids at home going are they easily distracted or is it all right so i've worked out that um children all they need is uh, a stack of haylage bales and they're completely happy um <laughs> ours, ours are uh loving being homeschooled rosie my wife was a primary school teacher um so you know she's uh, in her element doing that and you know for them it's 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 amazing the adventures of of being uh being at home and although they're taking their work quite seriously they're six and eight um they're they're sort of jumping on their ponies and um riding before virtual school and uh, afterwards as well and um we're trying to add in a few a, a few sort of life skills like um how to uh build a campfire and how to change a, a bicycle tire and uh the, the sort of elementary essence of running a business and things uh we thought start them young and try and give them a little bit more of an input than just doing their normal maths and english i think um, i'd quite like to come to school at, at team mead to be honest that sounds amazing fun harry which of those subjects are you teaching uh, so I'm, um, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of very much the assistant uh, teacher. I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not leading uh, the way. But I'm, I'm being called on for uh, things like I'm doing um, Anglo-Saxons uh, because that's a topic, and I quite enjoy doing that with them. Um, and then also uh, playing around with the globe, doing geography and how uh, planets move and seasons change and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's, it's a special time because we're on the road so much uh, normally. That often yeah, we leave before they're out of bed and, and get back after they're asleep at night. So it's um it's really nice to be able to sort of make the most of actually a bit of a change of routine. Although we're still very much, you know, sort of work goes on 
to a certain extent as normal, um, it, it's quite nice to be able to actually see more of the family and uh, be a bit involved. There is definitely that silver lining to it, isn't there? Um, that's actually one of the questions that I was going to ask you. So people have been sending in their questions over the last 24 hours. And if you would like to ask Lucy and Harry anything, then now is your chance. Just comment on the video and we'll put them to them a little bit later on. But Harry, one of the questions has been, what is happening with the horses at the moment? Are they in work? Are any having a break? Are you carrying on kind of as normal? What's the score? Well, I think there's, there's a few things. I mean, we're, we're trying to... Um, you know, chase a moving target in many ways because we don't know when we're going to be up and running again. Uh, so in a way, it's a case of trying to sort of create a, a good uh, sort of rational plan um, based based on what's likely to be the sort of outcome and, and when we're likely to start competing again. Um, but, but also rather than just treading water with the horses and keeping them ticking over, we're trying to actually make progress with them. So it's slightly different for some of the more established ones, but some of the less established ones, you know, they, in a way, can really benefit from this time and, you know, look to not only be ready to run uh, in a few months' time, but but really make the most of this and work on certain aspects and really tackle it and and, and have to have time for them because we're not torn between competing and training at home. Um, so from that point of view, we are carrying on very much as normal. Obviously, we're limited in what we can do. We're not leaving the yard. But we're very fortunate here that we've got, um, you know, we've got good natural facilities. So we've got, um, uh, you know, dressage arenas and flowers and everything else on, on grass. And uh, we've got hills, um, you know, doing some of the strengthening work. We've dropped down um, their fast work. So they're just, it, it's a maintenance sort of strength building exercise rather than uh, trying to build fitness work as such. But we also do want to be able to, when we get closer to the time when they might run again, to actually have them at a state where they are fit rather than just start to think about it then yeah absolutely rather than having to sort of catch up so to speak uh, Lucy we've obviously just touched upon the fact that actually it's quite nice to have a little bit of a break um but obviously a knock-on effect that it has business-wise how has that affected you over the last few weeks it's been a bumpy ride um it's um I've I've, I've got a lot of younger event horses um and so for them just as Harry said um, th this sort of small pause in the competition schedule. I I'm quite inspired by there are top dressage horses and top race horses who have had X number of days away from the arena slash race course and they can come back to win. And yes, uh, absolutely. You know, you hear about some Grand Prix horses in, uh, in the dressage have, have only done X number of, uh, of events before they appear on the big stage with the shiny lights and they win their big classes. So Producing my young event horses has not really changed thanks to the lockdown, other than the fact that I can see them every single day, which is brilliant. Um, I am now heavily involved in pre-training race horses that, um, for understandable reasons, quite a lot of them have gone home, uh, back to the trainer or in, indeed even back to the owner. It's only six weeks earlier than it should happen, but it slightly winded me. Took the uh, yeah. Suddenly have to sit up and think, my goodness me, my carefully laid out numbers not as carefully as harry's but carefully laid out numbers are going to take a bit of a hit and actually what goes around comes around i stayed calm uh, tried to anyway and by the end of a weekend i then had a phone call from another racing owner who said he had four horses coming out of racing that needed assessing to see whether the, they were going to go down the eventing route i mean what a dream phone call um so i've, I've done the whole thing from rock bottom and pretty low and quite terrified to um there's light at the end of the tunnel and how exciting what could these four be they might be a next erm leg possible hopeful oh we hope so lucy we really do hope so um tell us about your new yard because this was a real dream for you wasn't it and at the end of last year it really sort of came to fruition you moved in the horses moved in and it is the start of a new chapter for team jackson it definitely is. I think everybody in eventing will know that the margins are not enormous and um, and particular owner Neil O'Hara uh, and his wife Louise, um, just in conversation we were talking about why are the margins so small in our industry and one of the main reasons when we're looking back at my books is to do with rent. Um, the rent checks are crazy. It's not because we're renting anywhere supersonic, or but it's just what it costs to live somewhere else. So 
um, it was Neil's sort of brainchild that he had always wished to get involved in some form of equestrian property. Um, I was longing to get on the property ladder but couldn't quite afford to. And so the two came together in buying a bare block of an ex quarry in Norton, um, Gloucestershire. And um, it, the learning curve has been a little bit like that. Oops, maybe sometimes like that, sometimes <laughs> there. Um, just in terms of what it takes to build a place, project management, um, juggling plumbers and electricians and uh, groundsworks people. I didn't even know these folk even existed, let alone um, have to interact with them. But I think the end result is beginning to feel really, really exciting. And I think we're in an incredible area. I understand we have about a thousand racehorses in training within 10 miles of where we live. Um, four of my current string of eight eventers are off the track. They've all raced. Um, it's an area of the sport that I've always loved is the thoroughbred brain, the thoroughbred attitude, the thoroughbred ability, the thoroughbred gallop. Um, I'm a thoroughbred fan through and through, so it's so exciting to be more involved. Well, the the tra pre training of racehorses is an area that you've really developed over the last uh, sort of couple of years alongside the eventing, and actually that's an area we can come on to a little bit later on. Now you touched upon it there in sort of mentioning the event rider masters and your win last year at Mill Street. We're going to come on to that, Harry. I wanted to ask you career highlights. What has been the sort of the main bit of your career that you look back on? Is it the, the top three at badminton, a World Game silver medal? What's the bit that you remember the most at the moment? I, th I Keeping think you're you going have... in lockdown. <laughs> so I think um, you, you have uh, sort of various milestones, which although um, I mean, something I've learned to do over the years, I, I used to be very sort of tunnel visioned on the big games and you know sort of winning badminton you know trying to win olympic medals or whatever but you sort of learn to in a way appreciate certain milestones even if at the time it's not the be all and end all it's you know you're the first time or i suppose actually sort of even things like winning the pony cup championships which uh, i was lucky enough to do on a, a borrowed horse that belonged to um the dc of our pony club and she very kindly lent me lent me the, the horse and um and, and, and then riding on the junior team. And uh, and then I remember being really just having this, you know, obviously any, uh, probably like a tennis player wanting to play at Wimbledon, any event rider, you know, long sort of riding at badminton. And uh, I think, you know, the first time riding there was a, was a big, a big achievement. And then, you know, that shifts on to being, you know, sort of riding there 10 times or whatever. And, um, and then your placings and so, as you say, been in the top three and had numerous top ten placings, and would like to tick that box of winning it. Um, so I think all of those, and and also getting getting the call up to ride on the senior team uh, at a championship. Yeah, you know, that's that's you know, there's certain things which in your career are, are really important steps. And I think you know, Rosie, my wife, and I do sometimes instead of just always looking forward and always being, you know, there's an element in sport that nothing's ever good enough. You know, you're always focused. You're always slightly beating yourself up. And actually it's quite healthy to be able to sometimes turn around and reflect and enjoy. And, and, and whether that's just about, you know, you've got you know, great children or, or, or you've been able to, you know, you, you've got a business that, works and you know, being able to buy your property and you know, just things like that but also with with uh you know sort of achievements within your career from a performance point of view so uh those are sort of i think some of the some of the highlights i think that's really nice actually because it's so easy as you say to always be reaching for that next thing that when you achieve that thing that you have been reaching for that to very quickly kind of move on and go okay well what's next but actually it's nice to go do you know what, this, this was a big thing for me at this time and actually big tick in the box and then you can move on. Uh, Luce, how about um, you in terms of your career? Obviously, Willie Do was a massive part. He gave you your first New Zealand senior team call-up, 2014 World Championships in Cannes. He was a massive influence in the early part of your senior career. Yes, and funnily enough, he's the only one who's really looking at his watch this season saying, I'm sure it's March and it's been... <laughs> There has to be something happening. The others are too green to know, really, that now is March. He's still in my yard. He's 19 years old. 
um, he teaches everybody what they need to know. And um, um, yeah, he, he, I've got an enormous amount to thank him for. Um, and it's through riding him for Mark and Gillian Greenlees that um, I was lucky enough to be able to buy um, Superstition, who was their next um, sort of uh, big excitement, another little brown gelding, um, nondescript, I think, in terms of looks, but um, a huge character, huge performer. And he's certainly given me my career highlight in my in my Mill Street win last last season and um, has since gone to Harry. So it's quite a cool, um, you know, wheels within wheels. We're so lucky within the sport that that happens and then, you know, can follow his progress. So um, I feel, um, yeah, I, I think Again, the lockdown's doing slightly weird things to all of us and it just <laughs> makes you take your foot off the gas for two seconds because we haven't got anywhere to accelerate to just at the moment. So again, like Harry was saying, it's really nice to look back and think, that was a cool show and I actually did really well. My lovely owners, the Greenies, messaged me the other day and said, I watched the Mill Street video and you'll never guess what, you won. Oh, was- amazing. Can we, oh. can we talk about Mill Street? So... Uh, last year, Event Rider Masters, you went to Chatsworth for leg one and you finished on the podium in third place, which was a little bit of a surprise to some people. They didn't see you coming. He had a brilliant top 10 finish at Bramham in the long format. And I remember talking to you actually on the eventing podcast, pre-Mill Street on the on the preview show, and you were quietly confident. You were sort of very much, this is how I'd like it to play out, but I'd like you know a few people to be ahead of me and I'll go and catch them. And it absolutely did. It was one of those fairy tale performances that actually you can't go back and fault anything. It all fell into place and actually gave you your biggest win to date. It definitely did. It was it was a close um, a close victory, but I, it doesn't matter how close really does it as long as it's that point one or point two ahead. Um, I remember a similar feeling weirdly before Badminton 2014, which is my best badminton result with Willie Do. Um, he came 11th and. It was the feeling in the build-up that you didn't want to change anything. And I wish I could take myself there when I needed to, but it's very recognisable when it happens. Um, and, and I'm sure Harry knows exactly what I'm talking about. When, when things are going right with a particular horse, with a particular goal in mind, it's a really um, calm feeling. It's a really satisfied feeling. Every bit of work you do seems to go the right way. And there are other approaches to other events and you think, I'm trying so hard to just improve this one movement in the dressage or this one part of his technique over a fence or this one bit of my riding on the cross country. And I just, for some reason, it just stays a tiny bit out of reach. So um, I think I'll I'll look to use this time to studying how to catch that in, you know, bottle it, I suppose, so that you can use it when you really need it. But um, retrospectively, it was a recognizably calm, orderly, uh, happy build up and I think the horses know that I think if you can bottle it Lucy you'll be on to a very very good thing there'll <laughs> be a lot of people wanting some of that um you've actually mentioned before that you should write a book how the event ride masters changed your life because it has in the space of 12 months changed your life quite literally it it, it absolutely has and I think um what we're so lucky with this amazing sport we've got. Eventing is, it's super exciting. There are some amazing people involved. We go to some unbelievably beautiful venues. Um, and it's still one of, I think, the most old fashioned sports um, in terms of you're as close to an amateur vibe within a professional era. Um, because we all can still be friends, we can all still talk to each other, we can all still, um, glean ideas from each other's training programs. And I'm not sure in every sport where there's tons and tons of money, I think that gets lost to a degree. So I think where the ERM has been so clever, it's it's bringing a, a, a prize pot in that's so revolutionary really for, for our sport. And we're, we, we need to go more down that route and maintain some of our values. So for me, to have the opportunity to pit myself against the 25 top seeds in the world. I was a wild card at Chatsworth, um, but I had great confidence in the horse and and it's a lovely event and um, we'd had a good build up. So that that went better than I could have dreamt of. Then Bramham went better than I could have dreamt of. And then Mill Street was just the icing on the cake. The downside of the brilliant Mill Street (laughs) was that it made my little brown pony quite famous in quite a short space of time for doing 
what is effectively actually only a short fourth. You know, he hadn't won Babington or Burley or an Olympic medal yet. I think Harry's going to hope. Say Harry's, <laughs> Harry's definitely saying yet. <laughs> yet. Um, but, um, you know, it is a very public eye and it, it couldn't have gone better for him and, and it, it, in the two showings that he had on TV. So um, I'm hugely grateful uh she says just slightly trying to eat that out to to erm for the opportunity and i think i hope it's the start of great things for our sport because it, if you can earn a little bit of prize money and put your horses and your abilities on a showcase to the world you you, you can you can increase the professionalism you can increase our earning capacity you can increase our ability to stay in the sport um because we can actually sustain it as a, as a living Absolutely. And actually, the next chapter in the superstition story is now with you, Harry, because after Mill Street and the win there, he was sold. Very good owner of yours bought him very much as a championship horse in mind for you. Tell us about taking him on because big shoes to fill. uh, But you guys obviously get on very, very well. And it's been a relationship that's continued, hasn't it? Yeah, and, and, and Lucy's done the most amazing job um, producing him. I mean, funny enough, he wasn't actually bought as a, as a championship horse in mind. It, we'd sort of we sort of vaguely on the radar before Mill Street and, and that's where um, Leona and I first had the conversation uh, so it's sort of just you know it's brilliant for, for Luce to have that uh, you know sort of amazing last uh, run with him and but but it was really a case that um, you know the owner had sort of had you know she'd been looking for something she hadn't particularly talked to me about it but to, you know, for, for a horse that was up up the grades, and you know, for me it was really special because most of the horses I've ridden throughout my career have either been ones that I've produced from three and four year olds, um, or they've possibly been sort of quite difficult horses that have been either with other people which they haven't wanted to ride, or occasionally sometimes haven't been able to ride. So to to take on a horse that's up the grades, and particularly. You know, Lucy's well known for being such a good, great producer of, of horses and he started out his, his career with Lucy's sister Sophie, Sophie Miller, Sophie Lane, um, who, who's a brilliant producer of young horses as well. So he had you know, between the two of them, he's had that wonderful start and it's a real privilege um, to be able to sort of build on that and, um, and, and, and have that sort of great foundation um, then, then to work on. And actually, you went at the end of last year, you, I think, had had him 10 days. You took him up to Osberton and then took him to Stregom over in Poland for the long format four star, literally within the first 10, 10 days of having him, which you won in very good company. Um, that was an incredible start to your partnership together. But obviously, you've had a winter of training. I imagine a little bit frustrated that things aren't cracking on now in 2020. What is the plan? What was the plan? Are you a little bit excited that Tokyo has been delayed to 2021? I th- I, uh, so I don't want to get ahead of ourselves because it's just being quite philosophical. There's so much, you know, there's so many challenges with horses that you can dream and hope, um, but at the same time, you're trying to deal with the reality. And in many ways, a, a little bit like what Luce was just saying about that feeling when you could, you have the most uninterrupted um, sort of, run up to a big event and and you try and analyze what it was that created that in many ways it's not um uh, the frantically working towards a, a, a big goal it's, it's that things are just seamlessly going well and so the priority you know, i always think rather than sort of saying you know oh, you, you, you're obsessively looking at selection and who might be in the running and whittling it down it's, it's actually it's just about concentrating on yourself and your horse or horses and really just looking at potential weaknesses, potential areas you can try and help them in and and be very focused about it. So you're not just working hard for the sake of working hard, you're working hard in a very focused, analytical kind of way. And so, yeah, you, you can take positives out of everything. I mean, it's frustrating for everyone to have put in a real slog of work over possibly one of the most grim winters I can remember for a long time to then come out with your horses, uh, you know, going, a1 and totally prepped in all three phases and a lot of that evaporates some of it will stand you in good stead for, for, for months or down the line or next season um but 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 um some of it will evaporate like sort of simple things like fitness um but but it's certainly having that time to be able to build on that 
partnership. I mean, as you said, we went straight to Os Osberton, but not to compete just because I was already competing there with other horses. So if I only had uh, 10 days to get to know him, four of which we were driving across Europe to Poland, um, the other six were at Osberton. I had to take him with me and, and try and get to know him there. And, uh, you know, we've, we've done an event that's gone well and it's, um, yeah, it was a reasonably high profile one. So that's all great. But it's then just trying to build on that and make sure that we keep, uh, you know, keep coming up with good current form. And so, yeah, I'm going to use, use this time and uh, it might be no bad thing that we've got a bit of, bit of extra time and, uh, and, and, and keep focused and, and working towards the big, the big game. Using the time very wisely. Um, can I ask, will he do another long format four star or do you think you might step him up to five star? Uh, so I'm going to be guided by him. Um, I, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's working really well at home and he's, he's feeling great. So um, my aim was to uh, very much sort of start off uh, the season with, with some uh, four star shorts in preparation for a long or whatever and, and, and just listen to him. And you know, in, in many ways, sometimes when you have horses that you've been together for, with for a long time and particularly when they get to a level, like if you produce a horse up through the grades from a young horse up to being a five star horse and you've, you've had them at that level quite a few times and it might be your third or fourth badminton or birdie that you're going to, you, you, you can very much follow, you, you can almost whistle down your preparation to, um, you can streamline it so you know exactly how much work you need to do in each area. And it becomes, it's sort of all about efficiency. So the horse is still fresh. They're not having too much mileage put on them, but you've done everything you need to do. And each year you learn from what you did in the previous year. There are variables if you change that from one event to another, or if you do it from one horse to another. But um, when you've got the opposite of that, which is a horse that A, you haven't been with for that long, and B, moving up the grades, um, then, then you've got to do it slightly the other way around and very much listen to the horses and when they're telling you that they're absolutely ready to then go up the next step, then you say, okay, let's do it, rather than picking your goal and working them backwards from there. I think that's very, very sensible. Um, let's go for some questions now. So if you have any questions and you're watching for either Harry or Lucy, then pop them in the comments and we'll put them to them if we've got time very shortly. Uh, the first one is from always.eventing on Instagram. And it is, have you ever had a bad injury while competing? I'm actually going to come to you, Harry, because obviously you have had a really bad injury back in, I think it was 2013, wasn't it? That you had what could have been a career end ending injury. Yeah, it's, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it was sort of fairly well broadcast, but um, I, I had a I had a fall where um, I had a rotational fall. So where you somersault over a fence and, um, and I had both my arms out to break the fall rather than, you know anything up around this area which it was it, i remember it very well it was basically like diving off a diving board to an empty swimming pool head first and you know people said in a slightly patronizing way or could you could you have rolled but the reality is when you have one of those rotational pools it's not like a racing pool where it's fast and you've got a forward trajectory to the pool it's just a slam dunk into the ground and um and i i shattered um both my arms at the elbows um, and into powder. Um, so, so that was sort of a very long, painful recovery. And you know, we didn't know whether it was going to take uh, sort of years or be forever. Um, and it was, yeah, to, to cut along, very tedious, uh, short, it was, um, it all came good in the end. And after a lot of uncertainty, which I think definitely brought us close to the skin. And when I say us, everyone involved with my team is, really grim challenging time and and quite scary at times um and yeah we 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 got through it and uh went on to then have ironically the best uh the best season i'd had uh to date uh straight off the back of that and um yeah just sort of goes through that good can come out of bad and um it was yeah that was it and you actually had your uh, eight months on from your injury when you could have never ridden again you actually um were third at badminton so was it incredible recovery um one question which actually i really love is from jill it says i've used your story as inspiration to my son who's had an injury that has meant he has had to take a year out of any sport he's five months in have you got any advice for him yeah i think um so i mean i had sort of an interesting uh, what is his his uh sort of time is spent doing but i was literally hanging I and mean, my arms were hanging from 
hooks on the ceiling. Uh, they took the bones out um, and tried to do a mosaic to piece them back together. And I had a lot of time literally sitting and, and not, not able to do, do anything other than move my head. Um, and so that was really an opportunity to, to reflect and think. And when you look at what you've done, and it's most likely you're going to be looking at it in the past tense, you, you immediately think of, you, know, you you review what you've done and you think, particularly if you had a second chance, you know, if you go back and do it again, you know, what would you do differently? And you know, you, it's a re real sort of soul searching self analysis. And so, so that was you know, one thing which I you know, would suggest is use that time to really reflect and reflect what's important to you. And if, if you weren't gonna be able to do something again, and then you had a wish list of you know, two or three things, what would you be trying to achieve? And, and then use that so that everything's done in a targeted, focused way. You're not just frantically working hard. You're 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 trying to achieve certain aims and 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 being, being clever about it. But also then planning your route back. Um, I, I think it was there was a, an element that I was very conscious that you know, you've you got lots of time to think about it. And I was I was very open to the fact that I might have lost my nerve. You, 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 you hear of you know, people losing their nerve, but they don't normally find out until they get going again. And I think a little bit like you know, being an alcoholic or something, the, the people who are in denial about it are probably the ones who are more susceptible to, to suffering. And, and so I was very open with myself in the beginning. I just thought, well, look, it's, it's, there is a possibility because I wasn't knocked out or anything. I remember the whole thing um, very, very clearly. And, and I was there, therefore able to just factor in to my plan that, that, you know, that was something I, I was expecting to have to overcome. The reality is that as soon as I was, I remember jumping my first cross country fence and I, I, I had four horses that I was going to cross country school. This is when I've been riding for, for enough time to be able to ride four horses. I started doing so one horse for about five minutes and then building up. But I remember cross country schooling and, and, and thinking, gee, it's ridiculous to have ever doubted and any, you know, and put this plan in place because this is what I, was born to do this is just totally who I am and 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 where I'm comfortable and um I can do it without any kind of thoughts almost like you're in, in in your sleep but I still followed through the plan uh with all the sort of um backstops as if I was going to have problems and and that also probably helps not with from a confidence point of view because that probably wasn't totally necessary but just taking that um worst case scenario planning uh, that then meant that you, you actually probably laid the really strong foundations come back better than ever. I think that's really good advice, actually. Um, and it is something that has obviously really worked for you. So, Jill, I hope that helps your son. I hope he has a very speedy recovery. Um, one for you, Lucy. Hannah on Instagram would like to know what about rider fitness during lockdown? Are you doing anything else or is chasing a toddler, managing your horses, everything else enough for you? Um, I'm just being disturbed and trying to. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. That's um, all right. It's not a problem. If Evie joins us, then it's fine. Um, chocolate oh, buttons. Radish, radish hurts. Radish tummy hurts because she ate all the chocolate buttons. You go and eat them. <laughs> um, I am just enjoying for the moment. I need to call the doctor. You need to call the doctor for the dog. Oh dear. Okay. <laughs> We're getting out of trouble. I have to be honest. I've had such a busy. Um, so as I say, end of last season, then we moved and we've been building and I've been riding about um, 12 horses a day. We had 25 in work over Christmas and I do some work at other, other racing yards. So at the moment, are we into our, I'm, I'm gonna stick my neck out and say, we're we into our sort of second week of proper lockdown. I've lost total think track so. of any I don't. I mean, I don't know what day it is now, but yes, I think so. And two weeks, my honest truth is I absolutely haven't, thought even begun to think about going for a run <laughs> um I haven't begun to think about doing home pilates um I'm riding for a day at the moment um as a sort of um nice opportunity to to, to get to the yard but uh Harry my other half is away with the army and so it's just me and Evie which um is a whole new challenge Evie went to I, I've had help with Evie since she was five days old so um it's that's a whole new experience in itself uh, being a full-time mummy as well as a rider um, but I suppose if lockdown continues I do quite enjoy biking I do quite enjoy um, running I mean I enjoy it it makes you feel better afterwards you said enjoy there with a bit of a 
kind of enjoy yeah. it. So, yeah, I'm, absolutely. I'm, I'm not convinced. I think I'd rather muck out four stable stone pick a paddock and ride for than I would to go to the gym. Fair enough. Well, there you go. That is a good way of getting fit. Um, to be fair, just listening to you at 25 horses and over Christmas makes me tired just thinking about it. Um, one for you, Harry, Sarah Clark in Australia, who is actually a fellow five star event rider, uh, has said, when you commentate, you sound very analytical and insightful on how horses see and process things as well as their biomechanics. Have you always thought about things this way? Or is it something that you have actually researched and developed further? Um, so I've, I've, I've probably always had that mindset and as a result you either work things out yourself or you pick up things or you end up being interested in um you know sort of things often nothing to do with horses but but, but how things work because that's sort of how your your brain works i mean something i've always been fascinated by is seeing horses work on the lunge and seeing young horses work and just seeing them go from trot to cancer and physically what they're doing and um the, the sort of biomechanics and and by by having a good understanding of that it it it, it really helps you work horses correctly and what you're asking them to do and the amount of pressure you're going to put on and and anyone who's been to a gym and had a personal trainer beasting them knows what a miserable experience that is and and, and that actually from a training point of view and i'm probably going off the thing of how horses work physically but but I probably got an element of it from my father, um, who was obviously a successful event rider, but he he had a degree um, in engineering, and so probably again had that sort of mindset of of, of how the sort of biomechanics of, of, of a horse works, and he he'd also sort of then align that to their mindset, which is you're you're always on their side. You're not trying to torment them. You're you, you're you're there to ask questions and at times be demanding and at times be very sort of um uh sympathetic but but when you're demanding it's 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 done in the right way so you you ask them to do something but it's all about a bit of pressure and reward rather than um r rather than sort of constantly having them under the thumb and and that can then transfer into any discipline within riding and in many ways when we think about what we're doing i try not to when i teach things i try not to use the normal terms which are sort of equestrian related but often what you as a trainer might interpret that word to mean is often received by the person who's being taught in a different way and they might assume that they know what that term is and you might assume you know what that term is but somewhere between the two it's been lost and so by simplifying things into uh, a more evocative way of explaining something often it can have a a, 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 a much more meaningful effect and if you provide an explanation as to why that happens then the person isn't just doing it and this is from a teaching point of view rather than a commentating point of view the person who you're teaching isn't just doing it in the moment you've asked them to do it but hopefully a plan to see that they understand why they've done it and what they've done and how that affects the horse so then when they're not with you uh hopefully it's it's a seed that is planted and germinates and, and goes on uh, to stay with them throughout the rest of their riding days I think that's a, a really interesting point and actually something that when you do bring it back to the commentating, um, I mean, we work together in the past and it's very much you want people at home to understand and to understand why that person had a run out or why they jumped that very well or how a horse saw something. Um, so it's a really, really good point. OK, just a couple more questions. I mean, I could talk to you two for hours, but we must uh, we must finish shortly. So one thing, um, favourite event and why? Lucy, I'll come to you quickly on that one first. That's easy. That's Mill Street. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to ask why. Harry, how about you? Uh, so, so I'd, I'd say the big, uh, the big, the big two in this country. So, Badminton and Burley, um, they're just on a different, different platform and different league. I think the combination of the, the history and and, and the heritage. Badminton is just down the road where where, where I live and have grown up. Um, is is surrounded by Badminton Estate. And, and and the fact that both events, you know, the, the, the long-standing heritage and and and, and knowing, you know, the, the champions who have been crowned there, who have come from all over the world, um, but the fact that there's so many spectators is that much more pressure on the the challenges of the courses are that much greater. It's what we strive for, and you'd always be disappointed if it was a toned down five star because you want the maximum pressure. I always think pressure is is is, is why we do it. We don't, you know. Yes, we ride horses because we love riding horses, but we compete the combination of the joy of riding, but also 
because of being able to be challenged. And you know, when you take that to the extreme, you want the challenge to be as big as it can be. And 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 from that point of view, that's where those those events sit for me. You can see as well. You get a right little smile when you're talking about it. Um, one last question. Uh, one horse in your yard for everybody watching at home to follow over the next year or a couple of years. Uh, Harry, apart from the obvious one in, in superstition, is there anybody else that people should be looking out for? Um, so, so the, I mean, there's, there's you know, horses like um, Away Cruising, Teneres, who have been at the high levels for a few years. You know, they're, they're sort of really exciting horses. But I think um, I, I've got a I've got a uh, a three star horse um, who will hopefully be moving up to four star uh, called Red Kite, who's uh, uh, another horse I've had um, since he was a four year old. Um, he is he, he's full of ability. He's an absolute twist in his brain, very spooky, um, but just a, a, a great great horse very talented and a great person which sounds ridiculous to say that but he's got a he's he's got he, he's very brave he's very capable uh he will try he gives the impression of trying to let you down um uh at the slightest thing but then will dig deep and try his heart out when it actually really matters so he has an interesting um campaign i i show jump him through the winter he'll have three or four days hunting and then go straight into his first event just to keep his brain um on it and, and organised. He's he's nine this time. Um, he was second in the intermediate championships of Gackham uh, in in the summer and second as well actually at Mill Street um, in uh, the three star long uh, in the autumn. So I think he's going to be a good horse and uh, looking forward to seeing what he does when he goes up a level. There you go. One for Harry in Red Kite. Lucy, how about you? Your one to watch for the next couple of years. Um, please, can I make it two? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so. The Greenleys and I went horse shopping um, after we'd sold uh, Superstition Stinky and it took us quite a long time as you can imagine um, and we came across a really gorgeous, he's, he was then five, he's now a six year old called Dasset Showman through Kate Rocher of Dasset Eventing and he is out of a full thoroughbred presenting mare um, by a Dutch stallion and he did his first BE100 at Swalcliffe and the Greenies and I were laughing that our last event was Mill Street and our next event was Full Cliff. And we had an absolutely brilliant day in the high winds and the freezing cold and all thinking we were mad to be eventing. And now we're so glad we went eventing because there isn't going to be another event for a little while. Um, but he's hugely exciting, very able, very good looking. Um, and I think the world could be his oyster. I think he's a very big horse. Um, and so we'll produce him really carefully, really slowly. He won't be in a hurry to go. Anyway, if, if, if wishes were events, he would end up doing the six-year-old's Osbert in the autumn. Um, but that would be the extent. He won't do a long format this year. Um, and then I've got a five-year-old fresh off the track that um, is owned by Trevor Hemmings. And he didn't love his hurdling was all I really knew about him. The reason that it turns out he didn't love his hurdling is because he goes so high over every fence, which for our job is an absolute dream. And um, I just haven't often come across a horse that understands uh, it all quite so easily. So, so uh, full thoroughbred and he goes out three days after his last hurdle race and jumps clear around at Retro Farm show jumping. So again, he's, miles and miles and miles away from the big stage, but he's some one that gives me a smile every single time I ride him. And, and I think Hillberry is his name. He, he He's definitely one I've got some hopes for. And he's that thoroughbred that you love. So Hillberry and Dasset Showman for you, Luce. Harry, Lucy, thank you so much. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you on EPTV. We could talk to you for hours, but we must let you get on. Um, Harry, thank you. And we'll look forward to hopefully seeing you back out and again. Fingers crossed we'll be on the road before too long. Thank you. Uh, and Lucy, good luck. We'll be hoping to see you back in Event Rider Masters classes in the future. And we'll look forward to that book, Get Writing It While We're in Lockdown. Uh, we hope you guys have enjoyed this. Harry and Lucy, you have been absolutely brilliant. Don't forget to join us tomorrow because it is a Grand National special. Many Clouds, who won, I think it was five years ago now. Uh, Oliver and Tanya Sher Sherwood will be joining Mike Catamull alongside Lake Nassville to relive that very, very special day. We'll hope you'll join us here on EPTV. Make sure you subscribe, tick the bell, which